Well, thanks so much for being in that service this morning. If you have your Bible with you or a phone or iPad, whatever you have, we're looking at Luke, the 24th chapter. Luke chapter 24. Now, there's a Bible in the pew in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to take that one. You're welcome to find Luke 24. If you don't have a Bible at home, you're welcome to take that home with you as just our gift to us so that you can continue reading what we would call this resurrection story. Because this morning, we're only reading a very, very small portion of what it says to us. So you're welcome to take that and continue reading and see what it might speak into your life as you talk about this raised life. Now, we know that the resurrection, of course, is now uh, several thousand years old, 2,000 plus years old, but we know the fact of that, that as rooted in history, is timeless in its relationship. It's timeless in what it's saying to us. It's timeless in the impact that it has in our lives and lives around the world. You may have uh, seen the news this morning, as I did, that came across my phone early about the bombings that were in Sri Lanka, the bombings of Christian churches where at least when I saw 150 people who were worshiping lost their lives because they were there to worship on Easter Sunday in that place. There are many who are against Christianity. There are many who are against Christ, but we continue to press on, right? We continue to move forward because we know the impact of a risen Savior. We serve a risen Savior, one who is raised from the dead and who raises us, who gives us new life. And that's why we're here to celebrate that today. Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1. I'll read a few of these verses and we'll look at this passage <clears throat> together. He says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. Now that's a key question, obviously. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Then they go on to say, he is not here, but he has risen. Remember I spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying it's necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of the sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Now that's a great a passage, and you might want to read that again on your own or with your family or take that with you uh, in that Bible so that you can go back and just look at that passage again. Inside of that passage, of course, those key words that these men, these angels spoken to these women who were at the tomb, simply saying to them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Because he has risen. He has risen. He is no longer in this place. And that really is the good news for us today, right? That really is the good news for you today, that your life can be raised in him, that your life can be renewed in him, that your life can be changed because of what he has done in being raised from the dead. That's the, that's the focal point of the resurrection. That's the focal point of why we celebrate on this resurrection day. Now, obviously, we continue celebrating on Sundays because it was on that first day of the week that he tells us, which is a Sunday, that they went. And so Christians then begin to worship and celebrate on Sundays because it's the resurrection day. And every week, right here in this place, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On this special day, we come together to do that, to focus on that, because we know that there was that day that it happened, and this day celebrates that, that resurrection Sunday. But the truth of this matter, the understanding of this passage what he has to say to us is an understanding that this is not something that was merely impersonal that was happening out there that has impacted history, but it really is a personal thing for us. It's a personal encounter that God wants with our lives. That's what the resurrection really is. It's a personal encounter that God wants with you. There are three ways this morning we're going to talk about that personal encounter. That is by a long shot, not all of them. But in these three ways, I hope that you might see how it affects your life. First of all, we see that the resurrection is a personal encounter from the Father to provide forgiveness for our guilt problem. See, the Bible says that we are guilty and we are sinners and the wages of sin is death. 
The, the payment for sin is death. And we could not be perfect enough. We could not be righteous enough to pay our own sin debt. There had to be the one who paid for the sin debt in our life. And the Bible would teach us that the resurrection is that. It is that, that encounter that we have with the living God, that encounter that we have from the Father that provides forgiveness for your guilt of sin. Now, there are lots of ways that we try to find forgiveness of sin. There are lots of things that happen in our life. First of all, we try to be people who are good. And if we think that we are good, if we are good enough, then we can have our sin forgiven. Oftentimes, we would ask someone, we would say to them, if you were to die today and if you would go to heaven and God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? We would respond by saying, oh, we're, we're good. We've been good people. We've done good things. We've helped people. We've been very socially involved. We've done all these good things. And we use that word over and over and over. But the truth is, none of us are good. None of us are good enough in order to gain heaven. It is only through the perfection of Christ and only through what he has done for us that is the one who relieves us of our guilt problem. Well, we also might say that, well, if we are going to be guilty, then we need just to not worry about it and seek everything we can do, seek all the pleasures, eat, drink, and be merry, have a great time in all that we do. And that's what people do, right? They find ways to cover up their guilt <clears throat> by saying that they, <clears throat> excuse me, they're people who say, we're going we're gonna to party, we're going to drink more, we're going to be involved with drugs, we're going to do anything we can to have our pleasures overcome our guilt. It's a way of simply trying to ignore that we're guilty. It's a way of saying that I can do whatever I want to do. I can, I can be more successful. I can make more money. I can have a bigger house. I can have more cars. I can do all the things I want to do in order to overcome our guilt issues. Yet the Bible says that it's not how it works. Because we come into this world with nothing and we go out of this world with nothing. Yesterday, there was a celebration of life for a pastor friend of ours who was a pastor of the church where I previously served. He served there for 28 years and pastor emeritus for a number of years, probably 30 years. He died uh, last Sunday at 99 and a half years old that he had been serving the Lord. Well, I served there as pastor. We did many funerals together, many funerals together. At one time, I think we calculated we had done about 200 plus funerals together over a six year period of time. And he often did those funerals with me. We would share in that. And he often was the one who would begin the service most often. And he often made the same comment. He said that this person that we were referring to and gave the date in which they were born. And he said at that date, they entered the land of the dying. You see, that's where we are. We're in the land of the dying. Uh, when we come into this earth, we enter the land of the dying. It's only when we become a follower of Christ and look to an eternity. It's only when we die and are in eternity that we are into the land of the living. It's a great word for us to remember. And oftentimes we try to overcome our guilt by these pleasures. The third thing that we do to try to overcome our guilt is to be religious. We try to be very religious. It might mean coming to church some. It might be giving some in the offering. It might be saying I'm going to be baptized. But inside that, it's just a, a religious facade. We look good on the outside, but inside, our hearts are not right with God. Our hearts are not where they need to be. And so if we can be religious enough, whether it's in Christian religion or other people say, and we heard Katie say that she tried other religions too, and most people do, in order to find something to fill that void, something to fill that gap, that, that God-centered void in our life that we try to fill with some kind of religion. I remember when I became a Christian, sitting in the balcony of a small church in southern Ohio, I had gone to church most of my life. Not that I liked it. Not that I enjoyed it at all. I tried to sit in back and leave as soon as mom would let me get out the door. That's kind of how it worked. But I remember when I was confronted with the fact that it wasn't about my knowing about religion and being in church it was about the fact that I didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I tell you, I'd been in church a long. I'd gone to lots of Christmas services. I could tell you all the story of Christmas and Easter. I had the pictures from when I was a little kid, and I got to have my hat to wear to Easter service. I had all those things. But when I was confronted with the understanding, that was just a religion. It was not my relationship with Christ. That my relationship with Christ came when I had to confess my sin. 
to openly come to him and, and say to him, Lord, I, I'm a sinner. I need you. I cannot gain heaven without you. I cannot play the game and, and be able to say, I'm going to make it to heaven. None of those things were going to happen. I needed that personal relationship with Christ. You see, it was at that point that the resurrection becomes a personal encounter from the Father that provides forgiveness for my guilt problem. The second thing, a personal encounter, the resurrection is a personal encounter from the Father to provide an eternal future in his presence. This is not the end. Just we don't live and think, man, when it's over, life is going to be great, and I'm living for the day. The Bible would say to us, there is a future, and in that future, it's either with God or not with God. It's either in heaven or in hell away from God. And the, this, this resurrection helps us to understand this personal encounter of the resurrection it says that Jesus has raised from the dead so that he provides for us eternal life. He is not living among the dead. He is not here among the dead. He has risen. And John, the 14th chapter, is a great verse to help us to understand that. When Jesus was talking in John chapter 14 to his disciples, he said this, and to us, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If, not, if it not, were not so, I would not have told you. I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am there, you may be also. You see, that's what he has done for us. He's given us that eternal home in heaven. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. See, he is at work in order to give us that eternal future in his presence. I love one other passage that I want to read. I, I think it's a great, a great passage for an Easter Sunday morning to remind us who are in Christ, of our eternal home and God's great love for us. From Romans, the eighth chapter, he makes this statement. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God, interceding for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction, affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it's written, he goes on to say, no, in all these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now that... That is an amazing reason to be able to celebrate on the resurrection day. The fact that he loved you so much that he raised from the dead in order to conquer sin and death so that you might have eternal life. He goes on to tell us the third thing. The resurrection is a personal encounter from the Father to provide a fulfillment for your greatest need. Now, there are people in this room who are fighting financial disaster, some are fighting physical illness to the point even into death. Some are dealing with loneliness and despair and conflict and hurt and all those things that go on in our lives. We know that. And we think that those things are our greatest need. But the truth is true that our greatest need is the great need of salvation. Your need today, if you're not a follower of Christ, your greatest need is the great need of salvation. Now, some of us in this room are believers in Christ. But what we need is a, a refreshing of the salvation. Paul, uh, David says in the Old Testament, Lord, restore to me the joy of my salvation. 
And my prayer has been two, two ways as we have come to this resurrection day. One, that if you're not a follower of Christ, you would leave this place saying, I am going to be saved today. And if you are a follower of Christ, you would leave this place saying, man, I have a renewed joy of the salvation that is mine. How do I get that? Well, I get that by reflecting on the price that Jesus paid for me. The price that he paid for me by dying on the cross his body broken, his blood spilled by raising from the dead the price that Jesus paid for your salvation. We talk about salvation being free. It's free for us. But Jesus gave it all. He paid the price for you to have that eternal home in heaven and have salvation. The second thing, we remember the gift that Jesus gave to you a gift of salvation. We have a brother sitting down here on the front row. He was telling me earlier that 87 years ago today, he became a follower of Christ. Man, isn't that amazing? 87 years ago today, this brother became a follower of Christ. Now, he, he remembers that salvation experience. He remembers what happened. I remember when I came to Christ. I remember when Christ came into my life. I remember the prayer. I remember how I, how I sensed the Spirit of God after I had said, Lord, forgive me that I am a sinner. I want to trust in you. I want you to come into my life. I want, Lord, for you to, to forgive my sins and, and make me right with you. I remember the joy of my salvation, but sometimes we have to be called to remember the gift of that salvation. And maybe that's what you need today. You need to recall the gift of that joy of salvation that David talked about. And then realize the change that Jesus has made in your life. Because when he calls us, when he saves us, we're transformed. The Bible says that we are a new creation Everything is new to us. Now, that didn't mean everything is perfect and everything is right and it's all going to be good because every one of us in this room has walked through difficult days. We are in the land of the dying. We know we're going to have all these problems. But in the middle of that, in the middle of that, we began to say, Lord, we thank you so much that we are changed because we want to be like you. We want to grow in likeness of who you are. And then the fourth thing, realize that others need Jesus as much as you. Realize that others need Jesus as much as you needed Christ. As we walk out these doors today, we'll go into a community that is hurting, that's struggling with things. We'll walk into families that are dealing with drug addiction, alcoholism, marriage breaking down. What do they need? We can give them lots of things, but the truth is they need to see Christ in us. Our lives that are living for him. Because that's what a raised life is about, you see. A raised life is about that change in us that God has brought about because we have confessed with our mouth, believed in that heart, that he has been raised from the dead. And Romans says, when you do that, you will be saved. And once we have that salvation, once we have that, that gift of salvation in our life, then we go forth sharing the good news of a resurrection day. Not just one day a year. Not just one time period of a year, but how our lives have been raised in Christ.